This is not guest host Larry O'Connor. This is guest host Kurt Schlichter, senior columnist at townhall.com, no Los Angeles trial lawyer, the author of the forthcoming book, We'll Be Back, The Fall and Rise of America, which you should order on Amazon. And, of course, the Kelly Durnbull series of conservative action novels, 27-year retired Army colonel. And I am having some PTSD, folks, because not not from war. Gosh, I was an armed car wash guy. Uh, but from Oklahoma, the mention of Oklahoma, because I did basic training at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, in beautiful Lawton. And uh, yes, I uh, I did not start as a colonel. I started as a private first class. So I am a Mustang from Officer Candidate School. Unlike you fancy, fancy West Point guys. Uh, we've got somebody uh, who's very special here today. And he is running for Senate in the great state of Oklahoma. Alex Gray, who has distinguished himself in an important way that we will get to. Good morning, Alex. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you, Kurt? I'm doing, I'm doing great. You have announced that you are throwing your hat in the ring to replace Senator Imhoff, uh, who is uh, retiring. And uh, it's a it's a fairly crowded field, but you've got you've got some pretty high, uh, great endorsements. You got uh, former National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, who you work with and worked with at the National Security Council, and you've got Rick Grinnell. And uh, I got to tell you, just those two guys being in your corner that's that's enough for me. Well, no, I've been very gratified by uh, having a lot of national security folks from the Trump administration who've endorsed me. We're going to roll out some more the next uh, several days. We've had uh, former, uh, current Senator Mike Lee from Utah, one of the premier constitutional conservatives Who w- in the U.S. Senate. And we'll be talking to him after uh, uh, a little later today. Perfect. Well, he, he, was, uh, he endorsed me yesterday. Uh, we also got the endorsement of Cash Patel, who was uh, chief of staff of the Defense Department under President Trump, was a colleague of mine at the NSC, was uh, the lead investigator for uh, Devin Nunez on the uh, Russiagate investigation in the House. Uh, so really, you know, you're seeing conservatives from across national security, fiscal conservatism, constitutional well, conservatism, well, rallying and, to this campaign. And most importantly, Alex, you are getting uh, the, the hardcore crowd. Which I am. I, as I say, I'm a former cavalry officer. I like to screen Hugh's right flank. Uh, I am a hardcore conservative, and I'm all behind you, not only because of your resume, and not only because uh, great guys like Rick Rennell and Robert O'Brien are behind you, uh, but because you are the guy that walked the disgraceful Vindman brothers out of the White House. You said, pack your stuff, put it in a box, and get out. And I got to tell you, anybody who does that, I'll, you know, I'll crawl on broken glass to get you elected. Well, Kurt, you know, you can imagine that I'll be, uh, I'll focus uh, a little bit on the the bigger picture of no, not talk about specific uh, folks that that we had to deal with uh, in personnel matters. But I'll say this, you know, one of the things I was most proud of doing for President Trump was making sure that the NSC was filled with people who shared his vision for an America first foreign policy and see that that was loyal, that ran effectively, that had competent, qualified people. And, you know, when when we came in, when Ambassador O'Brien and I uh, took those roles, the NSC was about 230 people. It was leaking like a sieve. It was still filled with people from the Obama era in many cases. It was filled with people from, from previous national security advisors, uh, who didn't share the America First agenda. And one of the things that, that I'm most proud of is by the time we left, the NSC had the smallest, uh, most most competent, uh, really just, it was a, about 110 policy professionals. It was lean, it was mean, and we had accomplished more in an 18-month period than I would say any NSC, probably since at least the first Gulf War, if not before. Uh, and, and that was really due to President's President Trump's leadership, but I think also because there was a, a core group around him, finally, after four years at the NSC, who believed in his agenda and was willing to, to do what it took to get it done. Well, Alex Gray running for Senate in Oklahoma, you've got the foreign policy chops, and of course you walked the Vinmans out of the White House, which endears you to uh, uh, veterans like me forever. Uh, but let's get a lightning round here. 
on other stuff, on domestic stuff. Very quick answers. What do we do about illegal aliens flooding our borders? If we can't control our southern border, we don't have a country, Kurt. That, that is the number one, I would say, that is the number one national security issue facing this country right now. If we can't control the, the flow of illegals coming across the southern border, uh, what we're, our sovereignty is, uh, is at risk. And so I, I think before we can talk about anything else, we've got to get our border under control. Alex Gray, would you ever vote for any form of amnesty for illegal aliens? I would never even consider it. Alex Gray, the Second Amendment, does is national concealed carry reciprocity a priority to you? The right to keep and bear arms wherever you live in the United States? It's a fundamental constitutional right, Kurt. We, we can't. One of the things that makes this country so special is our devotion to individual liberty. We have a strong national security abroad. We have a strong military for the purpose of preserving our individual liberty at home. And there's nothing more uh, connected to individual liberty than our, our ability to, to keep and bear arms. And so you would have a tremendous champion in, in that uh, if I'm in the United States Senate. Would you ever vote under any circumstance to limit the right of a law-abiding, healthy, adult American citizen to own and uh, uh, train with and use for the defense of themselves, their community, or their constitution, uh, what liberals call a assault rifle. Well, given that most uh, most of our friends on the the left side of uh, of the spectrum have absolutely no idea what a assault rifle is or is not, uh, I, I, I let me just tell you, I, I cannot imagine a possible scenario in which I would be supporting something like that. And I think, uh, I, I think the lack of an understanding of what end, uh, what end of a gun the bullet comes out of is, uh, is a real problem for our friends on the left when they're trying to talk about gun control policy. Well, Alex, as you can see, I'm trying to qualify you with hardcore conservatives who may have doubts because you did work in Washington. And I, I don't want them to hold that against you. What is your favorite caliber? Mine is 45. You know, I, I'm 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 going to agree with you, actually, Kurt. I, I think 45 is a pretty good caliber. America, yeah, yeah. See what we've got here. It, it, it's great that we are recruiting uh, candidates like you. Uh, CRT. Now, I talked to some uh, uh, very moderate conservatives as part of my podcast, which you can get on Town Hall VIP, uh, to find out what they're thinking. Guys who are a lot softer than I am. And, you know, I'm concerned about mean tweets. And I, you know, sometimes we need to work together and then, I, uh, you know, I reach across the aisle. And then I mention CRT and I see a 180 degree Jekyll and Hyde uh, change. Our people hate CRT. Would you support uh, laws protecting uh, college students and employees from being uh, discriminated against based on CRT type ins or, or forced to endure uh, racist CRT type insanity? Well, we, I would absolutely support protecting our children, finding ways, whether children especially, but look, I would also even extend it to the workplace, finding ways to protect uh, American citizens from indoctrination. I mean, it, it really is, it, it's creeping authoritarianism, the way the left in this country has sought to impose this rad radical ideological agenda uh, that's so anathema to liberty, to the Constitution, and to the historic way in which Americans have looked at ourselves as a, as a melting pot but we don't define ourselves based on our race and our background. I'm married to an immigrant. My, my son is going to be here. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we, on one side of my family, my, my son's going to be, you know, a descendant of the Mayflower on one side and a second-generation American on the other. I, I don't think we need to have hyphenated Americans. And to, to have a, a approach to, to race that, that, is so, uh, that, that, is, that is so radicalized the way we have with CRT – that goes against everything this country stands for. And so I think we have to look for ways to protect Americans from being discriminated against in the name of, of a radical CRT agenda. Well, Alex Gray, uh, you've said a lot of things out here that, today that have warmed my heart, and of course my heart was surgically removed when I went to law school. Uh, how can we help you and your campaign, if we so desire? What's your well, website? 
can go to alexgrayforsenate.com. Look, we've been really gratified. We've uh, we've raised $100,000 in our first 24 hours. So really tremendous support from across Oklahoma, across the country, you know, grassroots conservatives who, who've looked at uh, what we're doing and see, look, there, there's one person who it's easy to talk about supporting Donald Trump. It's easy to say you're for Donald Trump, you're for America first. It's another thing to put your money where your mouth is and to spend four years working for him. Kurt, I was with him from the first day he walked into the White House. I was one of the last two people to walk out of his West Wing on the last day of his presidency. I saw him leave, say goodbye to him when he walked on the Marine One. You know, it's a whole different thing to, to put your body on the line, metaphorically speaking, to try and serve his presidency and his agenda. Um, I, I, I will, you know, I would ask for support from all America First true Trump-believing conservatives, and I think we can make a real difference in the U.S. Senate. Uh, can you give us that website one more time, Alex Gray? we got about 15 seconds. It's alexgrayforsenate.com. Well, Alex, uh, look, uh, uh, you know, you, like I said, you warmed my heart uh, with your tale of walking the Vindman brothers out of the White House, those absolute disgraces. And how can I, how can I not be happy? With a guy who recognizes the superiority of 45 caliber. I'm Kurt Schlichter, guest hosting for the great Hugh Hewitt. We will be back, back on the Hugh Hewitt radio program. I'm guest host Kurt Schlichter, senior columnist at Town Hall, noted trial lawyer, author of the forthcoming We'll Be Back, The Fall and Rise of America, which you can order on Amazon coming out in July, and 27 year Army Colonel. I'm joined by Dr. Michael Oren from the State of Israel, a paratrooper. Dr. Oren, welcome. <laughs> I haven't called that in a long time, Kurt. Thank you. Well, look, I, I, I went and got my badge. I did my five jumps uh, essentially to meet girls. So, you know, it, in that way, I guess it was a tactical uh, maneuver. But let, let's get back to fun. I just to meet the ground, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I was talking to that. <laughs> well, Dr. Oren, uh, I got to tell you, I'm very worried, and I'm very worried not only for my own country, but for the state of Israel. Uh, this administration is seems to be on the verge of making an outrageous and uh, – literally insane deal with the thugs who run iran that will actually empower them uh to obtain the bomb threatening both israel and, and the united states uh israel's got to be worried oh of course we're worried of course we're worried and, and, and we're also you know dumbfounded we can't think of any logical reason why our allies in the united states of america would want to do this to us you know it's interesting this week both the crown prince of Saudi Arabia and the, the ruler of the United Arab Emirates refused to take phone calls from the president of the United States. I, I don't remember a case like that in, in history. I really don't. And, and the reason that if you take phone calls, because you know, I guess the president, was, the president was calling them to get them to ramp up uh, oil production so that oil prices in the United States would go down. But they're so furious at him. They're going out of their mind. Why would our ally the President of the United States, jeopardize our lives this way. Uh, it, it, it's insane to many of us here in the United States, too. I, 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 are, these, are these people so wrapped up in their faculty lounge ideology that they can't see that they're holding people's lives in the palm of their hands? Uh, I, I, I think one of the problems, Dr. Oren, is, and it, it affects many leaders in the West, is a lot of our kind of transnational ruling class are essentially unserious people who uh, have not experienced, uh, for example, what most of the leaders of Israel have experienced. You, you, most of you are uh, actual combat veterans. You, you've seen up close the wages of good decisions and bad decisions. Unfortunately, really. Some, some bad ones. What's weird here is that, uh, you know, here's an administration that came into office promising to do two things in foreign affairs. One was to restore confidence in the United States as an ally, and the other was to stand up for human rights around the world. You know, presumably the previous administration didn't do this. And, and what are they going to do? They're going to sign an agreement which, which, in effect, betrays America's allies in the Middle East and jeopardizes our, our future security, perhaps even our future survival, and... Uh, they're going to give tens, perhaps hundreds of billions of dollars to the world's one, one of the world's most repressive regimes. And, I mean, how does that square with the promises that the administration gave coming into office? It makes no sense at all. 
Uh, it, 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 it's bizarre to me, too, Dr. Warren. They, they seem to welcome taking actions that harm both America and its allies, uh, including shutting down our ind- energy industry here. I, you, you look at it and say, if, if you were America's enemy, what would you do differently? And I, I, I can't see it, and I can only hope that uh, some uh, uh, sane folks within our government listen to the appeals of our allies like Israel. I, I, I just find it mind-boggling. Uh, does Israel feel it's on its own and uh, that it needs to be ready to take appropriate action to prevent the Iranians from uh, crossing the nuclear threshold? Uh, Israel will. We'll take appropriate. We, we, we say we are not beholden in any way to this agreement. Certainly we object to it and resent this. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're going to have to do whatever is necessary to ensure our security and our survival. Now, we may have some interesting allies in the Middle East, but at the end of the day, Israel is the only a power that could take on Iran. And uh, and I believe we have that ability. Well, uh, Dr. Warren, if Israel has to act in its self-defense, there are uh, hundreds of millions of Americans who will be behind you. And uh, I, I know that you, you, you aren't interested in interfering in American politics, but from my side, uh, when, we take, uh, when we take control back, you know you will have a steadfast friend in the White House. Very quickly, uh, we only have about 30 seconds. What's your, as a military man, what's your assessment of uh, Russian performance in Ukraine? To me, it looks like they are not up to the standard I expected. Unless, unless uh, Putin has some other game up his sleeve, that it's a, a slow, slogging war of attrition, uh, waiting for the world to lose interest in the story, uh, and in time, all the time ramping up the pressure without actually getting into the major cities. Russians have had a hard time fighting in major cities, yes. Chechnya and elsewhere. And, yes, they're, and they're noted for game. that. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's Putin's game, just to, just to ride the whole thing out and squeeze these guys until they give in to Russia's demand. Well, Dr. Michael Oren, uh, Putin certainly doesn't have a lot of respect for what the West's ruling class, and frankly, that's probably deserved. I'm Kurt Schlichter, guest hosting for the great Hugh Hewitt. Seven-year Army colonel, graduate of the United States Army War College. Hey, I'm no war hero like Pete Buttigieg. I just ran a heavily armed car wash. Uh, I am also a senior columnist at townhall.com, a noted trial lawyer, and the author of the forthcoming Regnery book. We'll be back, The Fall and Rise of America. If you want to hear about all sorts of crazy stuff, like a national divorce, what would a civil war look like? Is America doomed? Spoiler, it's not. We're going to win. Go get. We'll be back. The Fall and Rise of America. You can pre-order. It comes out in July. I have a special pleasure now to introduce our next guest. I was just with him this weekend at a veterans event in Las Vegas. I worked side by side with him for election integrity following the flawed 2020 election. Also in Las Vegas. It's my pal Adam Laxalt running for Senate. Adam, good morning. Welcome to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Well, Adam, uh, a lot, there's a lot of stuff going on, and uh, as a veteran, you have a excellent perspective on this. Uh, I'm I'm wondering what you think about all this kind of loose talk about no fly zones, and uh, you know, even troops on the ground in Ukraine. I, I I know you support the Ukrainian resistance as as I do. But do you think it's in America's vital interest that we uh, expose, uh, you know, that we risk armed conflict with the Soviet Union? Uh, I'm sorry, Russia, Freudian slip. I think uh, I think it's incredibly important uh, that that we do not put ground troops on the ground or put ourselves in, in a position as a nation where we may have to do something like that. I mean, this is in Europe. You have a lot of countries there with armed forces. This is their backyard. I want to see their troops on the ground, uh, their their blood and treasure being being uh, risked uh, if, if if that's if that's the direction they decide to go. But you know, after a couple decades of wars, there's there's massive fatigue here in our country. I know our voters wouldn't support something like that. And, and you know, let's not forget that America, under the leadership of President Biden and, and, the, and, the, and his fellow Democrats, is in as worse a shape 
it's been in a generation. And people are feeling that acutely and keenly. And uh, we have a lot to take care of to, to, to save our great country before we're, we're, we're endeavoring and, and trying to save another country. Well, Adam Laxalt, uh, uh, running for Senate from the great state of Nevada, uh, you are running against essentially a non-entity. I literally will have to sit here and think about what her name is because she's done so little except be a reliable vote for Chuck Schumer. Uh, A 2,741-page continuing resolution just passed the House. It's going over to the Senate, where the Senate will have about a day to decide to vote on it. Uh, What do you think of that process, and would you ever vote for something that you couldn't read? You know, there's no question the process is beyond broken. Uh, We we can't even pass a budget as a nation, uh, and we keep jamming these massive bills down down, uh, not only the elected members' throats, but, of course, most importantly, uh, the the people's throats, because that's who feel the brunt of this. Uh, But, you know, this this is right, right now we're dealing with this this crisis of the Democrats that basically spin every single one of their failed policies. First and foremost, the energy price increases and the gas price increases, which we all know uh, started the day President Biden got elected. Hopefully your your listeners remember vividly when President Biden uh, walked directly about a foot from a young lady and he looked and said, look in my eyes. I will kill fossil fuels. And uh, here, when their policies from day one was to kill the fossil fuel industry, which, of course, resulted in continual spike increases, price increases, I should say, um, and now they're, 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 they're going with this new Putin price hike hashtag. Uh, they think they're going to get away with it. Of course, the media is dutifully supporting him in that, but we must hold their feet to the fires, their policies that put America in this terrible place that already dramatically increased inflation, energy prices, and, of course, the price of the pump. Well, uh, Adam Laxalt, you are what in the military we call the decisive point because you are the seat most likely to flip from Democrat to Republican in 2022 and then uh, you know there are several other seats that are potentially vulnerable but yours is the most vulnerable if we don't win in nevada we're not going to take back the senate tell us about how you're going to take on that non-entity of a uh, uh, incumbent senator and how you're going to win that seat look it's uh, there, there's a lot of races out there and a lot of races that are crowding for attention uh, but it's no exaggeration to say this Senate race in Nevada will decide who has the majority. We must win it. Of course, we must hold a handful of Republican incumbents as well for the math to work out. And, yeah, we should win the House. We should win a bunch of other races. But there simply are not many Senate races that we can flip. And I'm running against uh, Senator Catherine Cortez Masto, who is an absolute rubber stamp for the Biden administration, votes 96 percent uh, with Joe Biden, 98 percent with Chuck Schumer. Uh, of course, she's, she, she touts the moderate line, uh, but she has never led for our state against her left. You know, perfect example is not a peep about putting Russia sanctions on, on, on their oil over the last many, many weeks. I've been calling for that, obviously. A lot of Republicans have been calling for it. She waits till two hours after Biden makes his press press uh, conference two, to, two days ago before she finally tweets out that she supports that effort. And this is a pattern with Senator Masto. She will never break from her party. She does not lead for our state, whether it's borders, whether it's law and order, whether it was build back better. Uh, she just stands at the left. And I can tell you, Kurt, uh, people are ready for massive change in my home state. Uh, obviously, they're ready for massive change in America. And we plan on holding her accountable. Well, uh, Adam Laxalt, you've uh, you've actually earned some pretty incredible endorsements. I know Rick Grinnell, who was with us uh, fighting for election integrity in Las Vegas after the election, uh, he certainly backs you. And of course, your roommate at uh, in the Navy uh, backs you. Who 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 was that guy again? 
Oh, just a little-known governor from Florida, Ron DeSantis. Ah! <laughs> so you got Grinnell, you got Ron DeSantis. Anybody else in your corner who's... We, we do have uh, former President Trump, uh, who, who is uh, front and center and, and very supportive, supported me in the very first week. Uh, Senator Cruz, um, you know, you, you name it, really. Uh, pe- people are ready to support this effort. They know I'm going to go to D.C. and be part of... Hopefully this new generation. I'm 43 years old. Uh, when I was attorney general, I was a part of the, the small band of conservative AGs that woke up every single day fighting against President Obama and trying to save our Constitution. And we need to bring that kind of fighting spirit to D.C., uh, not just for all of D.C., but within our own party. And that's something I certainly intend to do. Well, you know, Adam Laxalt, I, I watched it happen when we were working together in Las Vegas. I, you were, you were up early. You went to bed late. You never stopped. You were always going, going, going. And I, I you know, we 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 had met uh, one or two times before that. Uh, but working closely side by side with you, I was impressed just by your energy, and that uh, you know bo- both reflects your family, which uh, uh, famously your uh, grandfather Paul. Laxalt was one of Ronald Reagan's best friends and uh, uh, a conservative leader, but also uh, your your military background. You you, you are an aggressive uh, officer. You 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 move to attack. You know uh, it, it's uh, it, it's our time is all I can say. Uh, pe- people know that our country is in grave trouble, and the reason I'm running for this seat is to be part of that change change that we massively need and um you know i i I think in the end of the day people want leadership and and people need to know that that people are ready to to fight for this country and it's something obviously i did in in uniform both in the navy and iraq uh, in my 20s uh but you know now now we've got to save the entire american project save the american way of life uh and look the good news is as terrible as things felt from you know basically january of 20 well adam we're, we're we're coming up against a break how do yep. we help you what's your website adam laxalt.com adam laxalt senator our next senator from the great state of nevada i'm kurt schlichter guest hosting here for the great hugh hewitt we'll be right back for the great hugh hewitt now you're probably thinking hey i can see he Hugh having the Sex Pistols as his bumper music. And if you do, my advice to you is take fewer drugs. Anyway, uh, we've got a real treat now. Uh, Someone I was on a panel, well, I moderated the panel. Uh, She was one of the stars. She made the news uh, at our CPAC panel on who the Democrats are going to try and foist upon us in 2024. You know her. You've seen her on Fox. You've seen her everywhere. She's got a new podcast coming out in the middle of the month. Monica Crowley, welcome to the Hugh Hewitt radio program. Hey, Kurt. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. And it was great fun to be with you at CPAC. Well, you made all the news, uh, but we'll get (laughs) to that in a minute. Uh, You are famously someone who began very young working for Richard Nixon, uh, perhaps our most astute foreign policy president ever. And you worked for him uh, uh, after his retirement. Uh, What would President Nixon think of the performance of the Biden administration in the myriad foreign policy disasters into which uh, this uh, uh, administration has stumbled? Well, thank you very much for that question. It's always such a pleasure to talk with you and to talk about my first boss, President Nixon, for whom I worked during the last years of his life, not when he was president. I, I was not even a thought <laughs> at that time. But during the last years of his life, I worked with him as a foreign policy assistant. And in fact, just now, Newsweek has published my latest column, um, you know, because people ask me the same thing all the time. What would Nixon do? What would he think about China, about Russia, about Ukraine, about a whole range of issues? So I put pen to paper and Newsweek has literally just published it. So I'm going to post it up on my Twitter at Monica Crowley and on my Instagram, at Monica Crowley underscore. Because I went back and I I looked at Nixon, what Nixon wrote during those last years uh, following the collapse of the Soviet Union. And 
what he wrote in his books and his last op-eds. And Kurt, I, you know, he really did predict the rise of Putin because he predicted the rise of a new despotism in Russia, unless the United States led a Western effort to jump in at that very vulnerable moment in late 91, 92, even early 93, when the Russians were without communism, without all of those institutions, and had begun a brand new democracy, which was flailing, it was weak, they had no institutions, no no kind of institutional uh, history or memory of what representative government really was. So Nixon put out a plan to George H.W. Bush at the time about how the U.S. could lead something like a new Marshall Plan to try to lock in and stabilize this new uh, democracy in in Russia and, and to try to encourage free market capitalism there so it could all take root. And, of course, George H.W. Bush and all the Western leaders ignored that advice. The one person who didn't, interestingly, was Bill Clinton. When he came in in 1993, he brought Nixon into the White House. They talked about a whole range of issues, including China and Russia. And Clinton actually committed some aid. Now, it wasn't nearly enough. It was it was sort of a very modest commitment, so it wasn't enough. But at least he recognized the need to try to intervene to stabilize the situation. Nobody really took Nixon's advice. And so Nixon's prediction of this new despotism that would fill that vacuum and have Russia back to its old expansionist tricks, including with Ukraine, as Nixon predicted, here it is. And so I encourage everybody to go to Newsweek and check out the piece, because as usual, Nixon was correct. (laughs) Uh, Monica Crowley, uh, what do you think Nixon would do if he materialized in the White House right now once again? Well, first of all, I think, like Trump, if Nixon had been president, we wouldn't be in this position to begin with. I think you're probably right. Yeah. You know, there there is a theory in international relations, it's an authentic theory, called the madman theory, (laughs) which is you want an American president who's not actually crazy, but, but is perceived as just crazy enough by our adversaries that they will think twice, if not three times, before acting against America's interests and and, uh, against our allies in the world, because they think, well, this president is just nuts enough that he might nuke us. That's what you want. Richard Nixon did it well. Ronald Reagan did it well. Donald Trump did it the best of them all, right? I think Um, very well. Yeah, so you wouldn't be in this position. But if, if we were, look, I think Nixon would have... Uh, had us on energy independence the way Trump got us there for the first time in U.S. history. If we weren't there as we are now, Nixon would have halted all Russian imports and got us as quickly as possible back to energy independence or to it in the first place. Uh, and there would be very aggressive conversations happening with, with the Russians about backing off. Um, Look, you need American strength. American weakness is provocative. And when we are perceived as weak, whether it's in real terms or a perception of American weakness, the wheels come off the world. Richard Nixon, you know, inherited the Vietnam War, and there were all these complications. But Nixon also took some very creative actions to try to stabilize the global situation until we could get back to a point of American strength, as we were a couple of years later under Ronald Reagan. So he did the opening to China, which, by the way, right now, Richard Nixon, and and prior to this moment, Nixon was very adaptable and very flexible. So while he opened China as a geostrategic move to counterbalance growing Soviet power at the moment, he would have done what Donald Trump wanted to do, but was stopped by the radical left, which is improve relations with Russia yep. to, to reverse it, to, to use Russia as a counterweight against growing Chinese it, that, power. You know, first. Monica Crowley, uh, so few people make that. Uh, and the point's so obvious. It's, it, it, it's really instructive that our garbage ruling elite... Uh, 
uh, is so inept that they can't see that basic principle that when you have a a, a three legged stool of power, you you kind of want you kind of want to try. You don't have to be buddies with them. But you can be an alliance of convenience against the third. And I, I, I look back on Richard Nixon uh, in, a, in an analog to the Ukrainian affair. The, uh, in the 73 war against Israel, Israel was reeling. It was being pushed back. And Richard Nixon famously said, send them everything that will fly and back them up. So we, we do have kind of a preview of uh, uh, the short-term tactical moves that Nixon might have made with regard to Ukraine. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, you know, Trump Trump really did put this into the modern world. You know, everybody was screaming, the entire foreign policy establishment, oh, you can't move the U.S. embassy yeah. to Jerusalem because the Arab street will go crazy. Well, he did it. He, he basically said... You know, go, go blank yourself, right? I'm going to well, go do it because it's the right thing to do. He did it. Nothing happened. Exactly, Monica it? Crowley. The, the, look, I'll get. Here's a challenge. What is the success? Name a single success of America's foreign policy elite since the year 2000. Just one. Just one. Right. We, we haven't. We haven't. We haven't. Our, and our we've had- our tar- We've had disasters of, of intelligence, too, starting with 9-11. Absolutely. That point. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think our next president is going to have to come in and uh, uh, clean house extensively. Uh, there is a lot of dead wood to be pruned. Now, at CPAC, we had a, a great time on our panel talking about who the Democrats are going to try and put up to uh, uh, in 2024. And the challenges they're going to face because of uh, President Biden's uh, gross and manifest incompetence. And you uh, you had a couple of uh, suggestions that uh, actually uh, made some news. Yes. Yeah, so you, you did a fantastic job moderating that panel. And you came to me first about Mrs. Clinton uh, because I was the only woman on the panel. So, I you know, I wanted a real crack at her and you gave it to me uh, all yours mrs. <laughs> mrs clinton has she is literally eaten alive by the idea that she lost the presidency not once but twice to two men who had a better sense of where the american people were at the moment barack obama and donald trump she has spent her entire adult life and maybe even her childhood uh, drooling to be president of the United States and put up with serial humiliations from her husband and so on in order to get there. And she still hasn't gotten there. So make no mistake, Mrs. Clinton still has the ambition to be president and she could very well run because nobody thinks that, uh, you know, the desiccated old senile man in the White <laughs> House now is going to make another five minutes, never mind another two years. So uh, they have to they have to bigfoot Kamala somehow, and that's going to be very difficult. She's a sitting vice president. She's a woman of color. So that's Mrs. Clinton. That's her challenge. But the way they solve the black woman problem, as I mentioned at at CPAC, without alienating the black female vote, which is critical to the Democrats, is to think about running Michelle Obama. And a lot of people poo poo that. I talked about this at CPAC. Oh, she's not political. They're making too much money now. She's not going to do it. She is a very political person. And she kind of solves all issues because she's very popular. She is immune to criticism. And she's actually taking the path that Barack and Bill Clinton and Hillary all took to the Democratic nomination writing an autobiography, going on a big tour to sell the autobiography. Oh. A big, big a ter- corporate deal. A terrifying vision of the future. Monica Crowley, where can we find your new podcast? We only have a few yes, seconds. It, yes, it's going to launch in the next, like, two weeks, and it will be everywhere. Thank you, Monica Crowley. This is Kurt Schlichter on The Hugh Hewitt Show. We'll be right back. And Minor Threats cover of the Monkees classic Steppin' Stone can only mean one thing. That Kurt Schlichter is guest hosting for the great Hugh Hewitt. And, of course, 
that Senator Jim Tallett is our next guest. Senator Tallett, I hope you appreciate the musical choices that I we're making. I was going to say, it must be great to be on the bridge and in command of the music, huh? <laughs> uh, yes, and, uh, you know, there are some commanders who are uh, calm and sober and collected, and then there's me in control of music. But, uh, uh, Senator... Well, sober anyway, I think. <laughs> I don't know how calm and collected you are, but I, I take, I've been watching you. I think you look pretty sober. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, sometimes you put a good face on things. In any case, Senator Talent, we got to get serious here. I'm taking a look at uh, what's happening uh, from a military. I retired United States Army Colonel, uh, graduated in the Army War College. And uh, I'm looking at the Russian forces, and it seems to me that uh, we have, uh, uh, and you, you should do this because you want to fight the strongest enemy. You don't want to prepare to fight a weak one. But it seems to me that we have seriously overestimated the capabilities both in uh, operational uh, action and logistics uh, of uh, the Russian forces. They're, uh, they don't seem to be hitting their marks as far as uh, taking uh, Ukraine. Yeah, well, this is this is what guys like you who know this stuff are arguing about, right? Is this a bad army, or was it just a bad plan, or is it both, right? Right now, I'm inclined to say it was just a terrible plan. And as a result, I think the Russians are going to win some battles, which is in the sense that they're going to cause tremendous damage in urban areas and kill a lot of civilians. It looks to me like they're losing the war in the sense that they're not going to accomplish what was their strategic political objective to decapitate the Ukrainian government and install a puppet who would do Putin's bidding and be able relatively at least to stabilize the country. That seems to me a long way away for them, from the, uh, you know, for them at this point. But I'm not prepared to draw conclusions about the overall operational capability of, um, of the Russian armed forces so far. Well, uh, Senator Jim Talent, we are certainly watching what the Russians do. I hope we're taking time away from important tasks like uh, transsexual awareness and yeah. uh, equity training uh, to look at what the Russians are doing and how they're fighting and, uh, and assessing that. I know our Chinese opponents are doing it, and they did it when we were in Desert Storm. Uh, where I was 31 years ago right now. I know they did it after the air war over Serbia. Uh, they watch very closely what we do. They take notes, and they uh, incorporate lessons learned. Are you confident that our military can do that, too, right now? Uh, yeah, I, look, I think, we're, I think we're good at that. Um, I don't think the problem has primarily been in the Pentagon the last few years. The problem is the policy we've been following in Europe and really around the world. I mean, look look at what we've done in the last 15 years in Europe. So we admitted a number of countries into NATO at the same time as we were drawing down radically our ability to defend them. As you know, as of 2013, we didn't have a working tank in Europe. The Germans were training with broomsticks in 2015 because they didn't have rifles, Right. So then we failed uh, to reduce Putin's main point of economic leverage over the West, which was energy. Particularly the Europeans did, but we did as well. We failed consistently to respond vigorously to his minor, more minor provocations, like the cyber intrusions, the overflights in the Baltics, you know, the whole thing. And we've been giving him concessions without conditions in the last year alone. We rolled over a new start, no conditions. Uh, waived Nord Stream, no conditions, invited him to a summit, no conditions. And you know, Kurt, weakness is provocative. And it's almost like we set the stage to structure the incentives for something like this, and now we've got it. Well, uh, retired Senator Jim Talent, you spent many years uh, in the Senate uh, working alongside Joe Biden, who was apparently in the Senate for about 340 years. And uh, you had a chance to observe him. I watch him uh, fumble around Ukraine. Uh, it looks like he's going to uh, wander into a disastrous renewed JCPOA with oh Iran. Oh, gosh, yeah. Uh, is this guy dumb? Does he just hate America? I, I look at this, and I, I, I'm baffled. No, he doesn't hate America, okay? I think what you can't, you cannot overestimate uh, the fundamental 
mistake and mistakes in judgment, the basic overall framework within which so many people in Washington approach the world. Now, you mentioned the Middle East. A lot of it isn't. There's a good article up in Tablet about the, the, the concessions that we're going to grant them, the sanctions that we're going to lift which are just unbelievable. It's why people are resigning, career people and political employees have been resigning from that team. But this is, the Middle East is a classic example. Biden thinks we can structure a stable and acceptable security arrangement in the Middle East around a partnership with Iran. Well, that's it's just, fantasy. that's madness. Uh, thank you, retired Senator Jim Talent. I'm Kurt Schlichter, guest hosting for the great Hugh Hewitt. We're going to be right back with another hour of stuff, so stick around.